to this year's Engine Week. It's time to learn all about engines in aviation. In this episode, we're going to talk about the maintenance and operation of the Rotax engines and a few things you absolutely need to know flying behind a Rotax. This edition of course is all about Rotax and before we jump into what Rotax has to offer today in 2022, soon to be 2023, I want to jump back to uh, the, the, uh, the maintenance side of Rotax. So guys introduce yourself real quick and then we'll go into that. I'm Ronnie Smith with South Mississippi Light Aircraft. I'm Morris Smith, I'm Ronnie's son and we, uh, we are a master repair center for Rotax. We, oh, we go through the engine service and do anything that needs to be done to the engine. We have full qualifications to tear the engines apart, split the cases, service them back out so that the customers have a good running engine when they get back. We can uh, take care of any service or maintenance needs that anybody, anybody has. Now, one of the reasons I want to come out to see you guys is uh, you've been in the industry for much longer than I have, of course, but uh, for decades. So how, how long have you been doing this stuff in aviation? Uh, well, we started in the mid-80s. Okay. And we've become a service center in long about 88, 89. And we stayed a service center 20-something years. And you start out working uh, on Rotax from all the way from back then? or? Well, yeah, I mean, we was run the farm, had the farm. When you own the farm, you work on everything, so... Uh, working on when we started messing with those little small airplanes and and uh, light airplanes and stuff that had the Rotex engines on them, it was just sort of fell right into place. We had to learn and, and start working on the Rotex engines at that time. And of course, all they had at that time was just only two stroke engines right. back in the 80s. And then finally in the 89, in the 89, early 90s, when the four stroke 912 was introduced. And then when did you come on board with the uh, family business? Well, I was on board uh, early on as a teenager, then I ventured out on my own as teenagers do for a while, then finally come back into the family business and uh, when dad needed me the most it seemed and come back in and we've just been full bore ever since. Let's talk for a moment about the different horsepower options Rotax currently has to offer. One of the most common engines in light aircraft and Rotax's entry level as far as price point is in fact the 912 ULS, which produces about 100 horsepower at 5,800 RPM. The engine, uninstalled, weighs about 125 pounds, and you can purchase this engine right now in the very low 20s USD. Next up is the 912 IS, which takes you from carburetors into full computer-controlled fuel injection and electronic ignition. This one still produces about 100 horsepower like the carbureted model, but is a little more fuel efficient, simpler cold starts, and of course, no carb synchronizing at maintenance. This weighs uninstalled about 140 pounds and a price point still in the low 20s USD and just a few thousand above the 912 ULS. Then we enter into the turbocharged world with the 914 UL, which is actually carbureted but turns out 115 horsepower at 5,800 RPM and it weighs uninstalled around 140 pounds. The price point on this breaks you into the low 30s USD. The big advantage of a turbo is not only more power, but keeping that same power and performance as you climb in altitude. And finally, the newest model boasting 141 horsepower with fuel injection and turbocharging is the 915 IS. With an uninstalled weight of around 180 pounds and a price point bumping up to the low 40s USD. It is highly recommended to install a constant speed prop on the 915 IS to take full advantage of the power as you climb to altitude. Let's jump back in to the maintenance side of Rotax. Well, one of the issues in the, as owner operators is we don't understand how to properly check the oil. Now we have venting of the oil system, which is uh, burping the oil system. Once we can take, when we first go out to the aircraft, we take the oil cap all the way. So one of the reasons why the owner operators can't check their oils is because they can't get the dang cap off. That's it, man. Uh, this one here likes to not have came off either. All right, Morris, so, so what is the more common things that you've seen through your years of working on these things that the owner operator have messed up on or just wasn't aware of operating their engine? 
Well, like home in Continental Technology, you pull a dipstick out and you've got your oil quantity at that, at, right there at hand. Where with a Rotex engine, it's a dry sump oil system that we need to burp the engine before we check the oil. And most of the time when we burp the engine, or before we even burp the engine, we pull the dipstick out to see where the oil level is. Then we put the dipstick back in, we rotate the engine in direction of rotation until we hear a gurgling sound. Once we hear the gurgling sound, then we pull our dipstick out and we will see what the oil level actually is. One of the things that people do is they don't properly burp the engine to get the oil out of the case back into the can so that we see the proper level. If we have a quart or so still left in the engine that we think is missing from the can, then we'll add a quart to it. Then when the engine is running, the oil, excess oil in the case goes back into the oil can itself. Then we have oil residue blowing down the can, blowing down our aircraft out of the vent tube. And then I get a phone call. My engine has got an oil leak somewhere. What is going on? Then I have them check to see where their oil level is at that point, and it's usually flowing out the top of the can. So one of the things as an owner operator that is an issue is properly checking the oil. So on the topic of oil and the importance of checking your oil, what happens when you run an engine out of oil? Then we sling a rod, bust our piston here and cylinder. We've got cracking here on the piston and we've busted our cylinder. The engine at wide open will run less than 30 seconds without oil pressure. So if you do see a decline in oil pressure on your engine and it lasts more than 30 seconds, then it's usually an oil pressure sender issue versus an oil pressure on the aircraft, on the engine itself. Uh, we do run into the occasion where we have sender issues and people call about, you know, I don't have oil pressure. Well, there are certain ways you can check to make sure you do have oil pressure. If you're out in the field, stuck at an airport well, you can give us a call and we'll tell you a few things to check to make sure you have oil pressure to properly make it home safely well here's a few other things we need to look at as far as fuel consumption and fuels being used because the rotex engines have anywhere from 11 to 1 compression ratio to an eight and a half to one compression ratio we need to use the proper fuel octane now the turbo engine is eight and a half but it's turbocharged it needs to use 91 octane and above we can use 100 low lead with no problem in any of the engines at any time, but we can only use 87 octane in the smaller 80 horse only. If we do not use the proper octane for the proper engine, then we can get into a detonation issue which will bust ring glands and cause the pistons to fail prematurely. So we need to make sure that we use the proper octane. We need to make sure we use good clean fuels, even though we go to a store that says they have fresh fuel 91 octane no ethanol gas we need to verify that from the owner their self and from the manufacturer because we have ran into in the past where customers were getting what they thought were quality fuel but when we get their engines in here for troubleshooting we find out that they have a detonation issue in the engine because they were not getting the correct information on the octane of the actual gas they were using all right, Morris, talk to us about the, the, the proper starting of a Rotax engine and what some issues have come up uh, with, with improper starting procedures. All right, Brian, so what we have here is a Rotax starter. We see that we do not have an appendix drive on this starter. We have a sprag clutch system on the crank itself. Now, when we say sprag clutch system, people not quite understand what that means. So the simplest explanation that I can give you for that is if we're riding a bicycle when we go to pedal the bicycle we're turning the back tire and as we're turning the back tire and while we're pedaling it we can essentially assume that would be the crankshaft and we are the starter so once we are pedaling and we get to speed we let off of the pedals and we're freewheeling well that's the same way with a starter on a rotex once the engine is running the starter can let go and then it will freewheel so what we have happen is we prematurely on startup turn loose of the ignition and it kicks back because it's trying to fire and as it's firing we automatically let off of the starting switch and it kicks back well that can damage our sprag clutch so the simplest explanation for that to help people out is as we're pedaling our bicycle and we start downhill we do not have any more 
uh, pressure on our pedals because we have exceeded the pressure on it and that's the same way with a starter once the engine is up and running it does no longer damage the starter to run because it's freewheeling at that point and has no resistance on it at that time but if you let off too prematurely of yeah. the starter before it's fully started that's where it kicks back and can damage everything it, yes sir it can kick back and damage everything just Think about if you have your bicycle, you roll the bicycle backwards. The pedal itself goes backwards because it's kicked into the sprag clutch. It's the same way with the starter on the Rotex engine. So when the engine starts going backwards, it catches the sprag, spins our starter backwards, and also damages our sprag clutch. So you, you roll your bicycle back and your pedal suddenly is in your shin. Yes. Yes. All right, so a real world explanation here. How does the sprag clutch work in, in the problem you just associated that with? So we have the starter here with a freewheel gear and the sprag clutch spins as we see here we see it rotating backwards here so it will be freewheeling at this point but we cannot move it forward and that spins the engine this way when we drag it this way so with the engine running this will be idle none of this will be moving anymore unless we hit the starter itself and what, what we talk about on kickback is where this spins backwards here, rotates the starter itself in the opposite direction and can damage the sprag clutch assembly here, plus also damage our starter. We are partnering with great companies like Dynon Avionics at Dynon.com, AirTech Coatings at AirTechCoatings.com, Clemens Insurance at ClemensInsurance.net. The Aviators Clinic at aviatorsclinic.com. Foxtrot 95, Calhoun County Airport at flyfoxtrot95.com. Take a moment to go visit their websites at the links found below in the description of this video. And visit our website at experimentalaircraftchannel.com for events, our video library arranged in easy to find playlists on specific topics, affiliate products, aviation merchandise, and so much more. So, a couple of misconceptions about the Sprag Clutch is we often confuse the Sprag Clutch with the Slipper Clutch. The Slipper Clutch is in the gearbox. This is an example of the gearbox assembly from prop shaft to gear. This is the Sprag Clutch which is on the starting mechanism of the engine. So when we talk about you're slipping the sprag clutch, that is on starter. If we talk about the slipper clutch, that is in the gearbox. Now on the maintenance side of the Rotex engine, we have what we call a friction torque inspection and a slipper clutch inspection also. So don't get confused when you go to talking to your mechanics about which one, which inspection we need to do. All right, Morris, so we, we were talking off, off camera for a second and I learned something today. I didn't realize there was a 200 hour service on the carburetors. Talk to us about that. Yes, yeah, so there's 200 hour or five year service on the carburetors. Now, one thing, we have a diaphragm system on the carburetor, so we need to make sure that our rubber on our carburetor stays good and um, pliable and in good shape. One of the misconceptions is that the carburetors don't need to be serviced every 200 hours or five years, but that's not true. So at 200 hours, we need to take our carburetors apart, have them inspected and serviced, and we need to put new O-rings and seals in these carburetors because there are certain O-rings that are on the carburetors that will deteriorate and dry rot, and they will cause the mixture of the engine to change. We also need to make sure we change our diaphragms because if we don't change our diaphragms, then we might not be getting the proper suction on our piston to make the uh, engine speeds run properly at that point. Now also, if you do not know what year your carburetors are, there, and when we have a service bulletin, you can find your serial number on the carburetor in this point right here. Now note that the serial number is a two digit number plus four digits. The two digit number is the year the carburetor was actually manufactured, and the four digit is the production number of that particular part. Now at five years and at 200 hours, we should be changing our fuel pumps also. 
Now we can also look at our fuel pumps and we can see that we also have a time stamp on it and serial number wise. We need to make sure that we change them. If you do not have a, a gray looking pump like this and you have a gold looking pump, change your pump immediately because if you have a gold looking pump, it is well over five years old and there is a service bulletin on it and it will uh, fail. So after five years, you do need to change your pump also. So also at five years, one thing that we do not normally change or think about is our carb sockets. They are what holds our carburetor to the manifold. They also will deteriorate and dry rot and will cause the carburetor to fall off. So that's one thing that people do not change that needs to be changed at five years and on annual condition inspection, we need to verify that these are not delaminating and coming apart. All right, so Morris, I've, I've heard a lot um, talking to different people about these carbs need to be synchronized, being that they're pressure carburetors. What shows up that would tell the pilot, the owner operator, hey, I need to go have these, these looked at? So around 3,000, 35 to 4,000 RPM will get into a vibration issue. And if we have a vibration issue in that range, we need to have our synchronization of the carburetors checked. If we do not synchronize our carburetors, that causes premature wear on the carburetors itself. Plus, it just destroys our gearbox because the vibration transfers through the gearbox and we can cause ourselves to spend a lot more money than we would need to because of carb synchronization. Carb synchronization needs to be done at every 100 hour inspection or annual condition inspection. It needs to be checked by your mechanic. All right, so I've heard this synchronization word all the time with the Rotax. What exactly does that mean? What is, what is happening when you're synchronizing carbs? So what's happening when we're synchronizing the carburetors is in the Rotax engine, we have a horizontal opposed engine, well, which is serviced by two individual carburetors. The carburetors essentially are running an, an engine on their own. So one side is an engine and the other side is an engine also sharing a common crankshaft. And by sharing that common crankshaft, they need to run in synchronization. And by synchronizing the carburetors, we get both engines on the crankshaft running at the same rate. And we have a smooth running engine at that point. Now, when we set up our control cables for our throttle mechanism, we need to be sure we set it up in a proper fashion. One thing that is a misconception that we need to do is when we start with our adjuster here, which will be adjusting our throttle linkage to synchronize each carburetor. It needs to be set up in a centered position so that we can adjust to go either direction with our cable and with our arm. So, and also we need to make sure when we set these up that our cables don't have a lot of bow in them. They don't, they're not pulling tight, that the arm itself is on the stop in a neutral position with our adjuster in the center of the adjustment here. Now, one thing that I like to do is once we get the cables on and our, our adjuster in the center here, I like to take and look at this point right here, Brian. I pull the, car, pull the throttle lever back to where I have a gap in this area. And then I look at the other carburetor on the other side and I verify those gaps. That's called mechanical synchronization. And that'll give us an idea and a base starting point to see if we're even close once we get our cables put on the carburetors. Once we do that, we want to pull, pull them back to the idle position. Pull it back to idle position for startup. Do not start the engine in a wide open configuration. Make sure that the at any point in time you are starting this engine, that it is in the idle position. So what we want to do is we want to pull the crossover tube off on one side or both sides. We can pull it off on both sides and we want to hook our gauges. Now you can have any kind of gauges that you'd like as long as they're good for vacuum. These here are just simple uh, over-the-counter gauges that I have found that I like. We want to hook those up one on one manifold and then the other to the other manifold. 
Now, as we're synchronizing, we want to do so between 3,000 and 3,500 RPM. And we're not looking for any specific number on our gauges. We just want to verify that both needles are in the same exact position at the RPM that we are running at. Once we achieve that, then our carburetors and our engine is synchronized and we will have a smooth running engine at that point. Now, we want to start off with it between 3,000 and 3,500. The general question that I have when I rebuild a carburetor for someone is, you did not do my carburetor correctly because now I'm spitting gas out of my overflow. And then the first question I ask the customer is, have you synchronized your carburetors yet? And they're like, no, I have not because it's spitting gas out. As we synchronize the carburetors for the first time, we have to get the engine running first before we can synchronize the carburetors. If we crank it up and it's running rough, bring it out of the rough running side of it and bring it on up to where it's running smoother. Check our gauges and let's see how far out we are. Now, with this set of gauges, I can synchronize I can do either side of the engine. If I choose to synchronize the 2-4 side to move it and move the gauge on the 2-4 side, I'll use the 2-4 side or I may use the 1-3 side. So it's up to the personal preference of the individual which side they want to move the uh, to synchronize the carburetors. Now as long as I've been doing this, I still can, can go backwards with one or the other and get confused because different throttle setups have to synchronize in different fashions. So don't be afraid of trial and error to begin with. Then once you get the engine running smoothly between 3,000 and 3,500 RPM, then we want to come down to the idle and then set the idle accordingly. Now when we set the idle, this is the idle stop right here. When we set it, just a simple blades width turn of the idle stop will actually change the RPM 100 to 200 RPM on one side. So be cautious, be aware of all operations around you, make sure that everyone is clear at all times of you running your engine and make sure that all safety precautions are taken once you start doing this procedure. But essentially what you're, you're adjusting once you get that going is the, the butterfly valve in the carburetor by adjusting your, your pull on your cable. Correct, yes. We want to adjust the pull on the cable. Do not go back and change your swivel here with the, with the cable in it here because you will never get it synchronized unless you run out of room on your adjuster. Then come back and move your cable to the adjuster is in the center position. Do not adjust on the arm, it's on the arm, adjust on the adjuster itself here. All right, so let's talk about doing a leak down differential compression check on a Rotax engine. One of the things on a Rotax engine is the piston and cylinder wall is only a one thousandth clearance on those. The piston has uh, the normal set of rings on it. The cylinder itself is an aluminum cylinder with nickel seal coating on the inside. Now when we do a leak down or differential compression check on these engines, generally if we have a bad leak down, then it's generally deposits under the valves themselves that need to be cleaned and removed, then we'll get us a good leak down. Now staking the valves on the top is permissible to get a good seat if we see that we do have a bad leak down. So generally if you have a bad leak down on a Rotex engine it's due to just some deposits underneath the valves are set. One of the unique things about the Rotex engine is it has water cooled heads, air cooled cylinders and then an oil cooled oil system to help keep the engine running at proper temperatures. As we see here, we have on the head a temperature sender probe. If we ever have an issue where we think we have overheated the engine and we see that this probe has come apart and fell out, then that engine has been overheated. We can also take some of these points here where the hoses come together on the engine and move them. If those fittings are loose, then the engine has been overheated. Now, when Rotex came out with the new style head, they moved 
this dry cylinder head temperature to the top of the head which now it reads water temperature and when they did so they took the cooling fluid capacity out of the head they lessened that on the new style head the reason for that is is the theory of if we have less fluid moving faster through the head then it will cool better which with that being said read your service instructions and service bulletins that note that we no longer can use the Evans coolant in a newer style head on a Rotex engine such as the IS engines cannot use Evans coolant so be aware if you're having an overheating issue with the heads with the water system make sure you have the proper fluid in those now we talk about five-year rubber changes and things and let's talk about the fluid that's in the radiators and water system we need to change it as the manufacturer spe uh, specifications on the coolant that you are using to properly keep the system in good working order all right so one thing that uh, separates the Rotex engine from Lycoming or Continental is we do not have a mag system set up for the ignition system. We have trigger coils on a CDI ignition system on the UL engines. We have here, we have the flywheel with individual trigger coils to fire the plugs in the ignition. They're set up in a fashion that they fire um, top and bottom plugs on the on the cylinders. Now when we get into the IS engine it's not a CDI ignition anymore it is a electronic ignition on the fuel injected engines and the timing on it is a variable timing controlled by the computer itself. We do not adjust the timing on these engines we do not set the timing on them the ignition systems are life of the engine ignition systems so we don't have like a mag that we have to pull off every so many hundred hours and have sent off to be checked and cleaned. That's one cost savings on a Rotax engine is you do not have the external cost of the mag system or the ignition system. But if you'd like to learn more about these things, sign up for our classes at, at flyrotax.com or rotaxirmt.com and look us up South Mississippi Light Aircraft. Thank you. Thanks for watching today's episode of Engine Week. Tune in tomorrow for the next video in our series. And we invite you right now to like, subscribe, and hit that bell so you don't miss a single episode.